morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's uh, Asian Economic Development Conference. Uh, my name is Shu Tian. I'm a senior economist at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, this conference uh, is jointly organized by the Asian Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank Institute in the hope to promote a frontline research on key development issues in Asia and to foster communications among researchers and market pr practitioners as well as the policy makers. The theme of this year's conference is inclusive sustainable recovery in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, this two-day conference consists of 19 sessions covering a wide range of economic development areas. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite um, Mr. Albert Park, Chief Economist and the uh, Director General of um, Economic Research and the Regional Cooperation Department of the Asian Development Bank to deliver the opening remarks. See, Albert, please. Great. Thank you, Grace. Uh, welcome, everybody. On behalf of uh, the Asian Development Bank, it's really a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this inaugural Asian Economic Development Conference. Uh, the objective of the conference, as Grace said, is really to promote high quality research on a range of Asian economic and development issues, as well as to foster knowledge sharing, in-depth discussion and dialogue among researchers, as well as with development practitioners and policymakers. We know that as uh, just as the rest of the world, uh, Asia has really uh, experienced a lot of challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for example, in the area of education, the ADB has estimated you know, that school closures in Asia have been longer on average than most regions in the world and has led to extensive learning losses due to these school closures, um, equivalent to over a half a year of effective learning on average. Uh, and our Simulated estimates suggest that this will reduce lifetime earnings of children by about something like 6% with additional growth consequences uh, uh, if, if you account for general equilibrium effects. Um, we also know that the pandemic has led to an acceleration of the adoption of digital technologies, but has raised huge questions about the digital divide and the access to these new opportunities by uh, underprivileged groups. Um, small and medium scale enterprises have also faced a lot of challenges during the pandemic, um, and digitalization actually offers unique opportunities for uh, such enterprises, but in a very challenging environment. Uh, gender equality uh, and female empowerment are also issues that have been extremely challenged. We know that girls have been more um, vulnerable to learning loss and women in the labor market have been more affected by the pandemic. Uh, there's a great demand now in the region to build resilience and create more sustainable practices, especially this year with the uh, rise of huge concerns about energy security and the food crisis, which have been exacerbated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this is obviously really eventful times that we're living in. The ADB's economic outlook um, is that Asia will continue to recover uh, despite all of these global headwinds in a reasonably steady fashion, although there's huge headwinds and quite a lot of uncertainty related to uh, the continued uh, commodity price escalation due to the war in Ukraine, the slowdown in the People's Republic of China that we're seeing quite sharply uh, due to their very strict COVID policies, as well as uh, Fed tightening in the US, inflation hit a record yesterday. So uh, there's huge risks and lots of uncertainty. And at the ADB, of course, as we think about the longer term issues, we're very focused on the issue of climate change. And here there are, there are a range of really important research topics that we need to better understand in terms of how to think about the environmental and social costs of carbon emissions and how to include them in our economic models and to think more about the micro, microeconomic uh, issues related to adoptions of new technologies in the context of climate change, but also uh, the opportunities for new jobs, the just transition to make sure uh, that vulnerable groups are, are not uh, forgotten as uh, we shift to greener technologies, et cetera. So for all of these reasons, the theme of this year's conference um, is inclusive and sustainable recovery in Asia and the Pacific. 
And under this theme, we really hope to encourage cutting edge research that contributes to understanding some of the structural issues that are particularly important uh, in thinking about how the region can build greater resilience uh, to future shocks and to shift more smoothly to a sustainable future. So this is the first time we've organized this uh, event. And uh, first, I really wanna thank the Asian Development Bank Institute, who is our partner in this uh, venture or adventure. I also wanna thank my predecessor, Yasu Suwada, who really showed a lot of vision and played a key role uh, in conceptualizing this event. So as uh, Grace said, uh, it's really an exciting program. We have three terrific keynote speakers and uh, a huge set of excellent papers. We had over 200 submissions and, and I, I was on the reviewer reviewing panel for some of the sessions and uh, I can attest that the quality of the papers uh, in the conference uh, is really, really high, which we're very excited about. Uh, so without any further ado, let me stop there and uh, wish everyone great success. I hope uh, it's an enriching couple of days. Uh, I really wanna thank you for uh, your participation. We really hope that uh, you will keep coming back to this event. We plan to make it very regular and make it hopefully the premier event for development economics uh, researchers going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Tatsushi Tsunobi, Dean of Asian Development Bank Institute to deliver the welcome remarks. Dean Tsunobi, please. Thank you, Grace. Good morning from Tokyo. Uh, welcome to the Asian uh, Economic Development Conference. My name is Tetsushi Tsunobi. On behalf of ADB Institute, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to keynote speakers, Professor Rema Hanna, uh, Professor Yasuki Sawada, and Professor Shin Moan, uh, for taking the time to join us out of uh, your very busy schedule. I'd like uh, to uh, express my gratitude also to my ADB colleagues, Chief Economist Albert Park, Deputy Chief Economist George Begrick, and the Economic Advisor Don Hume Park, and the former Chief Economist Yas Sawada for taking uh, great leadership in making this conference possible to boost communications, interactions, and cooperation and uh, coordination among researchers interested in economic development in Asia and the Pacific. The conference has a nice acronym, AEDC, uh, which is easy to memorize, if not as easy as the World Bank's ABCDE. So we saw a very good responses from researchers to our call for papers, shortlisted pep uh, we shortlisted papers from a large number of applications, uh, as uh, Albert mentioned. And uh, further, we discussed to select high quality papers. Uh, Asia and the Pacific uh, is growing, and the world has uh, lots of uh, big uh, issues to examine. Uh, as uh, Arbat just said. So the Asia and the Pacific has great needs for uh, uh, lots of uh, high quality uh, economic research, uh, policy studies. So I hope ADC will grow quantitatively and uh, qualitatively into a great, great, great platform for us uh, researchers in the region and beyond, bridging uh, between research and the policy making and promoting policy oriented scientific research as well as evidence based policy making. So today and tomorrow, I hope all participants will participate very actively in the conference, writing questions and comments in chat box or a Q and A box. Last but not least, I thank the organizing team, uh, Gemma, Grace, of ADB and Junko-san of ADBI for great preparation with lots of care. Uh, with that, I hope we will have a very uh, fruitful conference uh, discussions. Thank you very much for your uh, active participation and for your attention. Over to you, Grace. Thank you so much, Dean Sonobi. Um, okay, now uh, let's uh, have our first uh, keynote uh, address of this conference. Uh, our keynote speaker is Professor Rima Hanna, 
Um, Professor Hannah is the Jeffrey Chia Professor of the Southeast Asia Studies and Chair of uh, the International Development Area at the Harvard Kennedy School. She serves as the Faculty Director of uh, Evidence for Policy Design at Harvard's uh, Center for International Development and is the Co-Scientific Director of JPAL Southeast Asia in Indonesia. Professor Hannah is also a research associate with uh, NDER. Her research revolves around improving the provision of public services in developing and uh, emerging economies, and her work has been published in leading economics journals. She is currently on the editorial board at the American Economic Review and previously was on the board of Review of Economics and Studies uh, Statistics and serves as a co-editor at the Journal of Human Resources. Today, Professor Hannah will give us a talk on her research on social protection in developing countries, lessons from Indonesia. Professor Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me... Um, uh, let me just... <laughs> it always takes me a moment to deal with uh, the technology. So. Um, uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm really humbled uh, to be invited uh, to give uh, the, the keynote today. Um, the topic I want to talk about, social protection, I think is extremely, extremely important. As Albert um, uh, uh, talked about in his, um, his opening speech, we're really facing a very unprecedented times, um, first with the COVID crisis and now with the fuel and the food um, food and the fuel crisis, uh, the increases in commodity, the uh, worries about increasing inequality given some of the education crisis. And we really, as a, as a society, really need to be thinking about how do we make sure that the most vulnerable are not left behind and everybody is up to a certain type of living standard and everyone is protected during these very challenging times. And this is where um, systems and social protection programs is very important. The research uh, we've done in Indonesia on this topic, um, it's, such a, it's such a big, um, important and extensive topic, so I won't get to all of it, so hopefully we'll, but I do want to give an overview and a flavor of the kind of questions that people are thinking about and the kind of research um, that we've been working on to try to think about how can you strengthen the ability of governments to provide social protection to those vulnerable citizens. So, you know, as we talked about, the economic crisis brought on, uh, brought on by COVID-19 really emphasized the importance of having these very strong systems. And in fact, you know, I've, I've been working on this topic for many years. I'm not, I'm not sure anyone was that interested, but then suddenly um, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, social protection became such a central part of the response that to make sure people were protected, especially um, first when they were in the initial lockdowns, making sure people had enough food to eat during lockdowns, making sure uh, people had enough basic necessities, but also um, as the lockdown started lifting with the changes in trade patterns, the industry being hit more than ever, the hospitality, um, uh, tourism, and so forth, trying to think about how do we make sure these newly vulnerable groups were being protected. And so you saw a massive expansion of social protection uh, during during the crisis. But it's important to note that this is it's not just that social protection was increasing during the crisis. It, it, as countries grow, social protection is going to become more and more important as a policy tool, uh, if history tells us anything. And so um, uh, the graphs I have here is just graphing out. The first one is looking at personal insurance versus GDP per capita. The second one, it's a bit of an older graph. Uh, but it's, it's one of the better graphs I could find, uh, which is looking at public expenditure and social protection as a percentage of GDP. And what you really see is that as countries um, grow, uh, that not only do they spend more in social protection in terms of dollars, they spend more in, in social protection as a percentage of GDP. So it becomes more and more important as countries grow. And there could be many reasons for this. It could be now that um, society has the ability uh, to help those in need, a much more ability to help those in need as they get richer. It could be that um, it, it could be that we often have seen uh, growing inequality at the same time. 
as, as rises in GDP. And then there, so there's also more of a need to protect the more vulnerable. But, for, but regardless of the reason, if history tells us anything, um, as, as countries continue to grow, as countries continue to develop social protection programs, social insurance programs are gonna be essential policy tools for the government to try to help the most vulnerable. So a key, a key challenge and something that I've been thinking about and working on for many years is how do you find the most vulnerable? How do you, how do you think about who are the most vulnerable? Um, how do you think about who are the poor? Um, and how do you actually uh, find them? And so it's worth uh, taking a step back and, and thinking through how, um, how things are done in, in high income countries. And then the challenge in countries where um, the labor, uh, the challenges in countries uh, that are lower and middle income where uh, the markets are very different and the information that flows through the economy is very different. So why don't we start with the high income countries and, and then we can see where the challenges arise. So in the US, there are a number of different um, social protection programs and policies that are geared towards uh, redistribution to the very poor. So we have programs um, such as food stamps, we have programs such as the earning of tax credit. Now, the way um, we find the poor is that like, most people are in the formal, um, formal labor market. Now there is a small percentage that are not in the formal labor market and they're really vulnerable and there's other, um, there are other uh, means and through nonprofits and, and sometimes they don't get helped as much as they can. And so there are challenges there as well, but for the most part, a large fraction of the economy is in the formal labor market. That means there's a paper trail. If I lose my job, I can go and to the unemployment office and show the paperwork and they can verify with the firm that I've lost my job. If I go to um, sign up for food stamps, I could verify through bank statements that I don't have that many assets. I could verify through my, um, my work statements, my, my pay stubs, um, how much I actually earn. And the government can also, through information through the tax system and through other information systems in the background, um, verify the information. And so you could actually use this information to, um, to do means testing and say, for uh, people of a certain income level, we're going to redistribute and transfer, um, transfer resources to you as part of these programs. And in fact, one of the, the, big, um, the, the big transfer programs in the US is done through the tax system. Uh, so the earned income tax credit, um, where when you, uh, when, for example, when I pay my taxes, um, there's a, a section on the tax form that asks information about, um, about my, you know, my income level, whether or not I have children, and through a formula within the tax, um, within the tax code, um, some people get money back from the tax system. They get more money than they paid in um, if, they're, if they're very poor. And so it's a, another form of redistribution that occurs through the tax system. Um, and in fact, actually, um, during the COVID-19 crisis, when the government just uh, decided to uh, target the fiscal stimulus checks, uh, they used information from the tax system to do so from the year before. So there is, a, there is, it's not perfect. There's a lot of challenges and problems like everything else in life. Um, but there is an information system uh, in order um, in order to think about who's actually poor and to try to figure out who they are, where they are, what their bank account is, and to get um, to get resources to them. Now, the challenge um, in low and middle income countries is that oftentimes um, there's a large amount of informality in the labor markets. So uh, a lot of people are engaged in agriculture. Maybe I'm, I'm growing food on my own plot. Um, a lot of people are engaged in um, a casual, uh, uh, casual uh, non-contract jobs. And so I might be working at a factory, but I don't have a formal contract that, where there's a, a formal record through the government of, of my employment. Um, the tax system uh, is the tax net, depending on the country, could be very low. So for example, where I work in Indonesia, I think it's like 86% of the country is not in the tax system or something like that from the, the last numbers I've seen. Um, the, uh, banking institutions, um, not everybody is banked. So uh, you, it's, it's very hard to show um, information about your assets. And to, at the end of the day, it's, it's just very difficult to verify who people's income um, is very, and to be able to think about how do you provide, um, how do you provide resources to them? And so 
a lot of governments um, in a lower and middle income governments have tried to really think hard about how to find alternative systems for identification of poor households for these transfer programs that is not just purely looking at income. Uh, the second challenge is um, the delivery of aid to targeted households. And again, you know, this is, you see this challenge in high income countries as well. So for example, um, there are uh, cases uh, during the fiscal stimulus in the US where, um, where there's fraud done, people applying for, social, uh, for the social benefits and other people's names using their ID um, system, or there were cases where checks didn't get through and people who were supposed to get aid didn't get aid. Um, but I think that the challenges are, are often larger in low and middle income countries where the, the bankings, uh, the, the, there are many people and particularly the poor who might be unbanked. Um, and so it's harder to provide um, uh, transfers to them. We're, we're worried about, um, uh, we're, uh, we're also worried about um, uh, transparency and information flowing through to citizens. Do they actually know what they're entitled to? Has that information come through the system? Can they advocate for their rights? Um, oftentimes these things are very challenging. And so what you often see in a lot of these programs is that even when we identify somebody who is eligible for a program, um, we identify them as somebody who's very low income and they're, they're really needing of assistance. Um, many times they, they don't get their benefit or they get a small fraction of the subsidy that the government intends to give them. And so the, there's another strain of research uh, that I've been very involved in and, and many other people have also been involved in as well about how can we make sure that people get the assistance that they're entitled to. Okay, so just taking a step back, I think then you know, before um, uh, many countries didn't even try and they would offer uh, blanket subsidies in the hope of reaching the poor. So one of the most common um, types of subsidies are uh, consumer energy subsidies and food subsidies. So fuel subsidies and uh, food subsidies. For example, in Indonesia, I'll talk about a program that existed before um, where they gave out um, free rice or a subsidized rice. Um, and these are actually uh, very common. Uh, the fuel subsidies are an extremely, extremely common one. They, for, uh, for many reasons, which I'll talk about now, governments have tried to cut them. We're actually seeing them creep up again. Um, with the, the current uh, fuel crisis. They're very popular. So with a fuel subsidy, for example, you um, show up at the gas station and you get subsidized fuel and you get your subsidy. And so it provides some assistance. Um, it's very popular. People really like fuel subsidies. Um, people like food subsidies. It's something tangible you see. Uh, the challenge with a lot of these, um, with the, these programs is um, they, they're often very regressive. Um, you know, for example, with the fuel subsidy, the rich drive cars, um, and so they often capture a larger fraction of the subsidy that you want to, to give out. And so it's not clear that the subsidy is being redistributed towards the poor. Uh, but and then on top of that, they're often very expensive um, because they're being given out to everybody. They're very large subsidies. Um, you know, for example, today with the, with the fuel crisis and the the fuel price is um, shooting up dramatically when you, the government is, if they have a fixed price for fuel, they're now responsible uh, for a lot more subsidy than perhaps what they, they budgeted to begin with. Um, you can see that for many countries, so here are some examples, um, the money spent on fuel subsidy is, is very high. And in fact, it's higher than investments in public health. It's higher than what countries perceive as foreign aid. We have all these states on foreign aid. Um, the, uh, just cutting some of the fuel subsidy could actually lose a, a lot more money for social spending. And then finally, there's often distortions in the market from these programs. So in food programs, um, it, it might change the, the price of food in, in, in certain ways. And um, with the fuel subsidy, you know, if anything, when we think about the, in the environment and climate change, we want to tax fuel, we want people to use less, and the subsidies often encourage overuse in particular ways um, based on the way the subsidies are designed. So the, 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 in short, um, there are, but you saw many countries doing this, um, particularly because one, they're very popular. People love uh, these kind of subsidies, but also because uh, it was very hard to have information to figure out how to target. And so this is much easier. You could just have gas going out, subsidized gas going out at the pump. You don't actually need to figure out who's poor, who's not poor. 
um, in order to provide resources to them. You don't need to figure out a way to get cash um, into somebody's hands um, if the banking system's not yet developed. And so these are, it's a, it's a policy that's it, it, it's appealing because it's easy to implement as well. Um, but then, um, you know, as uh, countries have grown, as more people are entering the formal labor market, as banking systems improved, as, as governments have um, more capacity to, um, to gather information about systems, uh, their citizens and, and do verification and try to, to really identify who needs assistance. Um, many countries have been trying to reduce uh, the subsidies and replace them with targeted transfers for households. Now, again, you know, this goes back and forth. I think right now with the fuel crisis, we're seeing, as I said, we're seeing them um, creep back up again. Um, but it, around the world, many countries have been trying to reform their energy subsidies. Um, and in the process, you, you worry that, for example, with the energy subsidies, the price of fuel goes up, price of transport goes up, maybe that affects food prices because now it's a little bit more expensive to ship food. And so the idea is then to do uh, transfer programs that are targeted at the poor to make up for the, the higher prices they might be facing as a result of, of reducing fuel subsidies. Okay. So, but then, as I said, this created, um, when you do move to these kind of programs, it creates new policy challenges. Um, and I talked about these two, the, these two challenges before. The first is, how do you um, know who is eligible to receive assistance and how do you identify them? Um, how do we make sure that the assistance actually reaches the targeted households? And so, again, these have, um, these have so many different components um, and they're so complex. And so I feel bad that I'm gonna like boil it down and just show you like one study on each, but uh, that's just a representative to get a sense of the kind of things um, that are being studied in this area. Um, but again, I'm happy to talk more when we get into the discussion part of, of today's session. Okay, so I'm gonna start with who's eligible to receive assistance and how do we identify them? Um, and so I'm gonna talk about Indonesia, uh, which I'm currently in Indonesia and very excited to be here. Um, again, after the COVID-19 crisis, first time in three years, so super excited. Um, where um, I do a, a, lot of, a lot of my research um, and where we have, have had a very strong partnerships with, um, with uh, researchers and academics here in Indonesia and with the, the government to study these really important policy questions. Uh, as many people were trying to really think about how do we improve social assistance programs and improve our the ability to, to really reach um, the foreign vulnerable houses. And so over the years, Indonesia has introduced a number of targeted transfer programs designed to do this. Uh, there were subsidized rice programs, there were scholarship programs for, um, for kids for school, uh, there's subsidized health insurance, there's cash, conditional cash transfers, uh, conditional cash transfers, and then also at various points, unconditional ones. Um, it's important to note though that uh, there, there is the, the general problem of how do you reach the poor and make sure that they have resources, make sure they have a basic living standard, um, make sure there's a that they have enough to invest um, in the health and the education of their kids. So there's the basic problem, which is, is really large as it is. Um, in COVID-19, it was even um, it was even much more of a challenge because it was happening very fast. Um, and the people who might have been vulnerable might have not been the same people who were vulnerable before. So there were systems in place to identify who was poor, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But now suddenly the type of person might be very different. So for example, uh, before when we often think of who is poor, we think of rural poverty. We think of people who are engaged in agriculture. Um, uh, but when COVID-19 crisis hit, the people who were really shocked were not necessarily the rural poor. They were, they were people who were working in cities, um, people who were working in, in restaurants and, and tourism and hospitality. Um, there are industries that were being affected by the crisis. Um, migrants, uh, migrant workers um, in cities were particularly vulnerable. So it's a very different um, profile, and the government might not necessarily uh, governments around the world might not necessarily have information uh, for for that type of worker because previously they might have not been in the social safety net system. And so, I think one of the things that I do want to talk about as we're we're talking about this is not just trying to identify who's poor in a static sense, but thinking about sort of dynamic systems that allow us to update 
um, update both the concept of poverty and how to identify how to identify the right people to provide them with transfers when they're when they're having a, an economic shock. Um, that is more dynamic over time and more flexible to allow for the fact that we know that the economy, you know, hopefully we won't have a shock like COVID again, but we know that the economy is always changing, different people are always being affected. And how do we create systems that are a little bit more flexible than what we've seen in the past? Now, this is, as I said, extremely, extremely difficult to do. Poverty targeting is extremely hard to do um, because governments do not observe data on incomes particularly for the poor. Um, the governments observe the income for formal workers, but formal workers are, you know, at the top of the, the we tend to be at the top of the income distribution. And it's really the people who are most poor and vulnerable who are not necessarily in the system. So what you see in many countries is a, a, a number of innovations that have, have been done to try to, to get at that information and alternative methods. Uh, and again, I won't have time to go through all of that. Uh, some of the common ones include, so one of the most common ones is a proxy means test, survey sweeps, where they collect data on observable assets and try to predict, um, predict use that uh, to create an asset index and predict who is a very data-driven approach. Another method um, that is often used is uh, community-based targeting, where uh, governments work with local communities to um, have them think about who in their community is most in need, and then to use that to determine eligibility for social programs. And then a third one is self-targeting. It's where, um, where you, you can actually go um, and identify yourself as needing of assistance. So there's, um, and you know, there are different methods to do. So you either go to social assistance, the social security office, or um, now there are a lot of web and phone-based approaches that people are experimenting with. Um, and there's usually some sort of verification method in the background to ensure that you are actually identifying correctly. Um, and in fact, actually, the, for example, the unemployment insurance um, in the U.S. is is a sort of self-targeted program where you, you show up to an unemployment insurance office or you call and, and you say you, you need assistance. So these all three kind of methods are, um, are very common. Oftentimes, um, they all have strengths and weaknesses. And so what you often see is that they're used in conjunction to help fill in the gaps from one another. Um, so uh, we're going to, I'm going to quickly talk about a study uh, that we did. Um, which is um, which is uh, comparing the proxy means test to the community-based methodology. Um, we've done other work on self-targeting and, and much more work on this area, but just to give you a flavor of um, some of the trade-offs between these methods and um, how the results can be used. So we uh, worked with the government in, of Indonesia to, um, to do a randomized controlled trial where we looked at what happens if you target from a proxy means test versus a community method. And then we did a hybrid approach, which was a combination of uh, PMT and community. But I, I'm gonna hold off on that one just for simplicity now and mostly talk about the community versus the PMT. Now the, the methods are, are, are basically what I explained before. The proxy means test, the government does a survey sweep. Um, and um, in this case, uh, the government of Indonesia uses 49 indicators to um, predict poverty, uh, it includes uh, household assets. So uh, the type of floor you have, do you have a dirt floor? Do you have a television? Do you have a car? It also then includes um, characteristics on like, the main income earner that you think you, that it's like harder to change. So for example, the education of the main income earner might have um, uh, uh, 20 years earlier, um, they, they're making those choices and so, um, using those basic demographic characteristics and um, choices there. Um, and then you end up um, taking a, creating the index, statistically creating the index mm -hmm. to predict out poverty and those with the lowest score receive the transfer. Now in contrast, the community method is um, designed to get at soft information. So that's a data-driven approach. The community method is designed to get at soft information. And so uh, what happened was, so the, uh, the government, um, uh, working with the government, um, 
we uh, sent in facilitators, uh, so community facilitators who know how to run a community meeting, who know how to work in communities. Um, uh, these these are very common um, in Indonesia, um, and uh, and they led meetings with the community to uh, determine uh, who's in need of assistance. And so what they did, um, which is actually um, from what I've seen, uh, oftentimes a very common kind of program, they they rank the community they, um, in terms of. These are the people who are very rich. These are the people who are very poor and need of assistance, and people at the bottom of the list receive the transfer. So, what did we find? So, there's a, a whole lot of results, um, but ju I'm just going to give you a quick flavor. So, for, first of all, the PMT method, the data-driven method, if you're just you know, looking at per capita consumption, the the PMT method um, worked slightly best. It um, had slightly, it had a lower error rate. But it's important to note that it's interesting. They, it, was, it had a lower error rate around the border of eligibility, where it's, you know, there's even, um, it's harder to say, you know, that this person is poorer than that person. And so it's not making mistakes for the very, very poor, but more at the border of eligibility. Um, and so, but then when you look at the community method, while um, the PMT method is, um, was, was good at um, hitting uh, capita consumption. The community method was better at hitting uh, people's individual's perception of who is poor um, in their community. And in fact, um, what's interesting is that the community method, um, the, how people chose, when you look at the characteristics of who was chosen, they looked different than under the proxy means test. So the community methods were also choosing people who are a little bit more um, vulnerable. So you'd predict out that they might be having a bad time in the future. So for example, let's say you had two households with equal per capita consumption, but one of them had, a, it was a widow or the head of the family had very low education. Mm -hmm. The community method was more likely to choose them than the PMT. So it's not necessarily, so even though the PMT did better just based on profit consumption, the community was also choosing on another form of vulnerability. Um, and so the conceptions of what poverty were under the two methods were also very different, um, were different as well. But because of that, I think because the community method uh, led the people to to match what the community perceived as poverty at a much greater rate than the PMT. It led to much higher community satisfaction. So um, it it, uh, it was easier to run the programs. Uh, people were happier with the programs. These programs are very political. I get the program, my neighbor doesn't. But actually, there's much more satisfaction, um, political satisfaction around these programs as a result of it. And so during the COVID nineteen crisis. The Indonesian um, uh, Ministry of Villages actually uses this community targeting method to fill in gaps in the um, gaps in the social assistance safety net um, system for people who were not on social assistance but were hit by COVID. They had community members actually identify them and use village transfers to provide in, uh, village um, funds to provide individual transfers to those households to fill in the people who were really hit by COVID but were being missed by the safety net system using this soft information that could be collected very quickly instead of having to do another big survey seek or something that would have taken time. Okay. So oh wait, am I am I am I over my am I over my limit? I thought I was hitting it <laughs> hitting it slightly <laughs> But I, but I wasn't sure. How am I on time? Have I, have I run out of time, or can I do one more uh, study? You, you, you may talk for three, uh, maybe three to four minutes more. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think this is always the problem. You always think that um, there's just so much to talk about because these things are so complex. Um, the the next study I want to talk about is how to ensure assistance uh, reaches poor families. And we did a number of studies here from improving transparency to try to understand if you can include private sector distribution at the last mile. But I'm going to highlight one study. Um, moving from uh, Indonesia is uh, instituting a large scale reform, moving from an in kind transfer program that was targeted, uh, a targeted in kind transfer program that was providing free rice uh, to a new voucher program, so food stamps. Where there is a digital, um, a digital, a digital voucher where you could redeem. Uh, you have a debit card uh, picture here. You move from your bag of rice to the debit card where you can go get rice and eggs at um, 
at the grocery stores that had the machines that could, could capture that. So the, um, they wanted to understand the impact of doing this. They were phasing in the program over four years, district by district. So for the 2018-2019 version, we helped randomize 105 districts. So I think that's about a fifth of the, the population to really understand the impacts of the program. And then use the National Sample Survey to evaluate it. So you could see this is Indonesia. Um, the gray are areas that had either gone in the program before or we're going to get it in the future. Um, the blue and the orange are the 2018 to 2019 districts, um, and they were phased in, uh, randomly phased in over time, over 2018 to 2019. Um, the, blue going, the blue going first being the treatment uh, is transferring first, and then the, the orange going second um, to be able to evaluate the program. Um, I'm not going to be able to have time to go through the graphs in detail, but the basic idea of what we found was that um, by moving the, there were a lot of problems in the in-kind distribution, uh, particularly a lot of the uh, rice went to households that were not necessarily poor. Um, and so what we found is that when they um, switched to the digital vouchers, more of the subsidy, uh, there was an increase in subsidy, which is, um, you can see this here, an increase in subsidy for the, for the households that were at the bottom of the income distribution. And how richer households got less of the subsidy. So it uh, spurred, for the same amount of money from the government and the program, it spurred a redistribution to the poor, to the targeted households. And that actually had big implications because, um, again, I, I don't have time to go through the table in detail, I'm really sorry. But what you actually find um, was that the it reduced poverty among, um, among the poorest of the poor. Um, and in fact, if you look at those um, with the PMT score of 15 or below, so that's roughly the bottom 15% of the country, we find a 20% reduction in poverty based on the increase in subsidy that they're receiving from the, the, the improved transfer program. Anyways, so that was um, uh, the, the, the other study. Um, it was really just saying that it, these design features of even things of what you give can have very big implications on, on the poverty rate based on uh, the access that the program gives and the amount of subsidy that households uh, receive. And so I, um, I, I know I've, I've run out of time. I do want to say that you know, for me, particularly the COVID-19 crisis really laid bare. You know, there's a lot of positives we have in terms of success stories, in terms of really trying to help the vulnerable during the crisis, but also a lot of challenges. Um, and it, um, trying to think about how we confront these challenges in the future, I think is an important part of research. Um, and um, the, from my own uh, research, trying to think about how do you create more flexible systems, I think is really important because we wanna be flexible and, and dynamic to meet the needs of citizens as things change over time to really find people who are, um, who are facing vulnerabilities. Uh, but that also thinking about very carefully about how we design these programs um, to have the biggest effect in terms of uh, uh, poverty reduction is uh, something that I think we all have a responsibility um, as society to do. Okay. And um, so thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rima. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, several questions from the audience. Um, I would like to invite them to, to ask, uh, mute themselves and ask. Um, so I think uh, we got two questions from uh, Paul. Hi, Paul, do you want to unmute and talk to Rima uh, directly? Okay, then maybe I'll just read out uh, his questions. Actually, he oh, has yeah. the two questions. Hi, oh, hi, Paul. One able, unable to unmute there. I think someone now let me in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Very interesting. And of course, uh, Indonesia, a very important country in, in terms of development and social protection. No, I, I just had a couple of reflections as you were talking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you tend to focus on assets uh, as opposed to income. And I would think that income uh, would be a more important um, issue in a crisis, right? Because it's, it's the loss of income that, uh, that affects people so much. And then and then do we sort of assume that people with greater assets don't need assistance because they could draw down those assets, like selling things, which is 
wow. which may be a good short-term strategy, but it's not good good in the long term because you, you lose maybe productive assets. So that was one one comment I had. Um, the other comment I have was, you know, you talk about tr trying to 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 um, f figure out who should target and who who is needy, and so on. I I just thought about the whole issue of social media and 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 whether that is useful. Of course, that that requires people to have access to social media or have access to phones. But was just talking to someone the other day about when the crisis started. I think it was in Samoa. They 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 used. Uh, they use social media to to quickly do a scan, you know, to do these quick scans of of people and who who is in need and what their needs are and and what the problems are they face. And as a as a as a useful quick uh, reach out. And as as uh, I think uh, Albert said in the beginning, you know, we digital is is everything these days. How can we ha uh, harness that for for social protection? Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Well, um, thank you. So I think those are uh, two good questions. So first of all, I agree with you completely on the assets. I think what has developed over time is that income is so hard to measure that um, there's been a focus on asset measurement because it's something that you could go and see if somebody has a TV, you could try to verify that. Um, and so uh, the development of these uh, targeting systems has been done on assets, but for exactly the reason you said is that it's not clear that they're necessarily um, the people who need assistance. And during COVID-19, they might not necessarily, you know, people who um, were asset poor for a very long time were not necessarily being the people being hit. It was people in cities. It was who had a loss of income uh, due to the, the crisis. So they weren't necessarily that flexible. So I think, so I agree with you completely that um, trying to think about getting at who's actually vulnerable in ways that are not just asset-based approach are really important. And so that's why we're doing work on the community-based targeting, which is getting at these software things of who's more vulnerable, who pays to shop, uh, looking at self-targeting methodologies. Um, if I can self-identify that I've had an income shock and if there's ways to figure out how to then make sure those people are helped, I think is a way to start thinking about how to make, um, how to make uh, the systems more flexible. Um, so I agree with you completely on that one. Um, and in fact, it, it, I was just trying to highlight the contrast of what is being done versus what maybe we should be thinking about doing. Um, on the second one on social media, I, I agree. Com uh, I also, I think I agree completely. I think what a lot of countries were also doing, there were two things uh, social media was being used for. One was information gathering um, to understand what are the vulnerabilities, to understand um, jobs being lost. Uh, we also um, actually tried to use uh, uh, like Google surveys and other type of social media to get out really quick information. You could run surveys very quickly just to understand what is happening in food prices in certain provinces and area, what is happening um, uh, to jobs in certain sectors and just being able to amass information quickly, I think was useful. It, they're not fully representative because not everyone's on social media, but it's a way to start. The other way was um, we actually also, another way we did information gathering was uh, um, uh, Indonesia has, uh, as part of the conditional cash transfer program, community facilitators that are in villages all over the country. So we used um, WhatsApp to run uh, online surveys with them to understand what was happening in their villages and try to understand what is happening to the vulnerable households that they're working with uh, very quickly and in real time at a time when you couldn't necessarily even travel to these um, remote areas by uh, flight and stuff during the crisis to try to even understand what's happening. So I think creative use of social media in that sense is very important. And the second um, thing is, I think the other one is about transparency. I think one of the key challenges of these programs, even when they're more universal, is that people don't know they're, they're eligible. It's hard to figure out what you're entitled to. And social media is a way to increase information about the programs. Again, uh, it depends on the level, I think, of um, uh, cell phone penetration in the country. Uh, you know, a country, uh, you know, Indonesia, a lot of people, for example, are on Facebook, um, you know, even very poor. So it's also thinking through the context of how you could try to use social media to get information to people in, in, in a good way. And so I agree that that's something also that it would be nice to do more research on and figure out, is it effective in terms of increasing transparency and knowledge of programs? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rima. Uh, next, um, uh, we would like to invite uh, uh, Jules to kindly unmute and uh, talk to uh, Rima. Thanks, oh, thank Jules. You.
So it's uh, Jose Navarro, and uh, I had a question. So during the, the COVID crisis, uh, health systems have been uh, turbocharged, and I thought maybe uh, using, how about using uh, health uh, as an indicator or proxy for poverty and health systems specifically, where you have doctors who, who would know uh, their parents, uh, their, their patients uh, best, and uh, how, how about leveraging the health system to provide this type of targeted economic transfers? I think that is uh, another idea as well. I think that I've heard of um, places where people have tried that, but I haven't seen a lot of good research about whether or not you get the right people into that system. And so I think that's something that I think would be really important and interesting to do. Um, because I agree with you, it's about, so for example, in the, um, the example that we were talking about of even just trying to find information on vulnerabilities for a food crisis, you were trying to use community facilitators because they knew communities well. I think some programs actually, one thing programs often use are nurse prep, like um, when there are nurses going into the villages um, through these mm -hmm. um, nurse practitioner type uh, programs um, and using uh, um, uh, using um, them to, to try to get at information on who is vulnerable. And this is something that I've also seen people increasingly do. And I think can have a lot of benefits because they know the communities well. Um, so doing more research, I think, in this area to try to think about that as a way to get more up-to-date, better information, I think would be super interesting. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, oh. Jules and Rima. Uh, Yotin, would you like to unmute? Thanks, Krista. Uh, thanks, uh, Rima, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, now, I just want to hear from you. Um, how do you see the application of uh, this type of study, um, this innovation studies uh, on other economies in, in, in Asia, or to be more specific, um, what will be the next country that you think would benefit from um, this type of uh, um, experiment? And uh, what will be the most challenging thing? Um, I see the randomization. I mean, um, are there hoops the, to jump through uh, to get the government um, agree on, you know, um, and, and, and so on. Um, yes, uh, please. Uh, thanks. That's, that's an interesting question. I think you know, there's, you know, the, for the lessons from Indonesia are probably very useful to um, a country like Thailand, which is developing their social registry system. It's probably useful, um, in, you know, income level, maybe Cambodia, Laos, and it might be less, you know, useful for Singapore, which has a very different system and is, is going to be doing a, a very different types of has different challenges that they're doing research on. Um, so I, I think in terms of the, the lessons um, learned from these particular studies I'm talking about are, are probably, um, you know, countries that are facing sort of similar challenges, uh, you know, Vietnam, Thailand, and uh, Cambodia, those um, would, be, would be interesting. And when we start thinking about the external validity of the study and, and what can be learned across. In terms of doing these kind of um, studies, you know, I, you know, I think with everything, it, it is hard. In some ways, it should be. So the government shouldn't randomize everything. <laughs> no, no, the government shouldn't do every study, but there really should be a lot of discussion about what are the right ones to do. Where do we feel like this is going to be useful because it's important? Where do we feel like it is? Um, it, it's increasing the knowledge that we need for policy, and so in that sense, I, for me, I think it's. It's really about um, having uh, having buy-in that these are important questions, and really spending the time thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing, and what is the right way to be doing it. And I, so I think it's something that is a, it is a, an investment. I do think it's very important. I think even when you think about the history of social protection, um, for example, even in the U.S., um, a lot of the way our social protection systems were designed in the U.S., there was a lot of uh, RCTs done um, to try to understand uh, if they're effective um, and how they are working. I think oftentimes they were done at the state level because the national government didn't want to do them. Um, and so it's also trying to find the champions within the government who really care about uh, improving evidence and transparency um, and, and are wanting to pilot and try things. I think for me also as well, the best time is when you're going to pilot things anyway. So for example, the second uh, second project I talked about, the government was rolling this out over four years. They were um, they decided there were certain districts that were going first, no matter what, those went out first. There were districts that were gonna be last because they wanted to spend more time 
building up the institutional cap capabilities in those districts to be through the banking system to be able to deliver the transfers. So, and then there was a bunch of districts in the middle and they were trying to figure out the order based on the budget they had and the capacity they had to do the transformation. There was really no good, you know, there's, um, there was, a, there is no good way. And so just lottering them up over the next year and a half over the order in which they were going to be done made sense because you could learn from it. And it was also not um, affecting the overall uh, policy and the decision of how they were going to do it. And so it made sense to naturally build it in. And so thinking of opportunities like that to improve, uh, improve our knowledge through research, but also not affecting the overall um, the overall way the program or policy needs to be run, I think is very important. And that's been I mean, to do that, it's about spending a lot of time really understanding the needs, understanding the challenges, being open to being creative about how we do the designs um, and really trying to think about not all, what are the, the incentives and the, the needs and the, the challenges that stakeholders, different stakeholders are facing and how can we build around that. Thanks, Rima. Uh, Tom? Could you uh, kindly? Yeah, hi, hi, yeah, hi, Rama. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for the presentation. This question is not about targeting, but about conceptual uh, conditional cash transfers, which are very attractive conceptually and have been successful in some cases. Um, most notably, Bolsa Familia in Brazil. So my question is this: In your view, what are the prospects for uh, CCT in Indonesia and other developing Asian countries, and what are the main barriers to implementing them? Okay. So I think the CCTs have been very effective. Um, my own view, um, and again, um, you know, there's a, a lot of debate is that so in many countries, the conditions are not um, are not verified very strongly. <laughs> um, and um, that people still get the cash even if they don't meet their conditions. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because you're getting, um, there's two things that one, when you impose, Suppose you impose the conditions and they're very hard to meet, the, the people who are probably least likely to meet them are the poorest and the vulnerable, which means they're not getting cash transfers and which means you're actually um, uh, not having them in the system. And so in some ways, so there's this very nice research um, by Burke Osler and others that show this, that when they gave these um, conditional versus unconditional cash transfers, the conditions actually help improve schooling a little bit for girls, but then um, for the girls, um, um, uh, the most vulnerable with the conditional cash transfer programs for those who dropped out, um, they ended up worse off because they didn't get any cash transfers. And so I think we need to think very, so I think it's not just about saying we're doing conditions, but thinking hard about what the conditions are. Um, there's been research uh, showing that the conditions that if you use lighter conditions, so for example, if you um, just use a uh, um, messaging that this money is supposed to be used for health and education. So like a labeled cash transfer, you see very similar results to adding on the conditions in terms of health and education. Um, and it, it might not have the negative screening properties if people don't meet the conditions. So that's also something to be thinking about. Um, I do think the other area for research is what level of conditions should we have? Should we, you know, a lot of these programs, they all look the same because they all follow Mexico's Progresso program in terms of all the conditions that they've been like replicated all over the world. But maybe we should have lighter conditions. So one or two conditions that we think are very important that people can meet and they're good for society. So should we have more or less conditions? And so I think there's a lot of research that could be done to improve the design. But I think at the end, it was a huge, huge, for me at least, and again, this is, um, uh, personal opinion, <laughs> we could differ. I think the huge innovation in the conditional cash transfer was actually the political, um, that it made it uh, palatable to say we're doing cash transfers because we have all these conditions added on uh, for health and education and investments. And it makes it easier to actually for governments to solve the programs, the electorate. Um, and so that's a, that's a big plus <laughs> of the programs. And so thinking through um, how do you, uh, the implementation of the conditions, making sure they're not too onerous, making sure that you're still providing protections to the vulnerable and they're included in the system, but also political is there is a, that's the balance that I think is interesting to be studying and thinking about. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thanks, Rima. And uh, sorry, sorry for um, for for those who has questions. There, we we run out of time, so cannot address them all. Um, maybe later we we can we can email and see if uh, we can see Rima to kindly discuss those. Uh, before we conclude uh, this uh, uh, this session, I would like to uh, thank Rima and all the audience uh, for for the for the presentation and then your questions. I would like to pass over to Carl for the information for the session one. Thanks, Carl. Please. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, so we have an exciting set of programs coming up uh, today and tomorrow. Just to let you know, our next session, session one, is a 9.15 Manila time, so that's in 15 minutes, and or 10.15 uh, a.m. in Tokyo. Session 1A is on education. Session 1B is on labor and demographics. Session 1C is infrastructure, poverty, and inequality. And session 1D is on gender. And so what we're going to do is we're going to paste the link uh, to the uh, welcome pack in the chat and you'll be able to access the zoom links there otherwise what you can do is you can just open up your calendar invite uh, for this program and you should be able to see the the zoom links uh, in there so we've got the link in the chat if, if you're looking to join one of the next sessions starting in 15 minutes uh, or you can open up your calendar invite and you'll see the zoom links there um thank you so much everyone and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next sessions Good, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good uh, evening, everyone. I uh, wish you enjoyed the morning session. Uh, welcome to our uh, second keynote speech of the Asian Economic Development Conference. Uh, please kindly um, unmute your, uh, mute yourself and then type your questions during the, um, the, the presentation, the keynote, and then I will open the floor for a Q&A after the talk. Now I would like to uh, introduce to you our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Yasuki Sawada. Professor Sawada is a professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Tokyo. He is also the director of the university's uh, Center for Research and Education in Program Evaluation. He's also a visiting fellow uh, in the Asian Development Bank Institute. From March uh, 2017 to uh, August uh, 2021, he served as the chief economist and the director general of um, uh, economic research and regional cooperation department of the Asian Development Bank. He has worked with many key development organizations worldwide, uh, such as uh, um, Japan International Cooperation Agency, Research Institute of uh, Economy, uh, trade, uh, in, uh, trade Industry World Bank, um, Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and East Asia, Pakistan Institute of uh, Development Economist, Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, uh, International Rice Research Institute, and International uh, Water Management Institute. His research interests include the development economics, microeconometrics, and the economics of disasters, and field surveys and uh, experiments. Today, Professor Savada will give us a keynote talk um, on preferences, behavior, and welfare outcomes against disasters. Savada san, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, for a very warm uh, introduction. And um, very nice to see you again. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, I'm uh, especially happy to join ADC 2022 uh, because uh, uh, this uh, event has been postponed for two years due to the pandemic. Now uh, I'm really happy to see this event is materializing. So um, let me. Um, talk about um, um, uh, disaster and disaster-related issues, um, I'd like to review basically literature and evidence on people's preferences and behavior and welfare outcomes against uh, disasters, particularly those uh, triggered by natural hazard. So this is the outline. Uh, first, I'd like to give you some background, uh, followed by um, uh, conceptual framework, and um, uh, disaster exposure preferences and exposed risk coping. And then towards the end, I'd like to discuss about overall welfare outcomes or welfare impact of disasters, and then our future challenges. So let me start um, uh, by a few charts from uh, Asian Development Outlook 2019, which handle uh, disaster resilience in Asia. Um, since the 1960s, about one third of overall global disasters triggered by natural hazards 
actually has occurred in developing Asia. So disproportionate uh, impact of disasters in Asia uh, we encountered. And on the right uh, uh, map, we listed high profile disasters in the region, including um, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami uh, outbreak in 2004, Cyclone Bangladesh 1991, Cyclone Nargis um, Myanmar 2008, and also ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Asia was the first, very first region affected by uh, COVID uh, substantially. Um, somewhat uh, conceptual framework. So disaster uh, is um, partly uh, man-made and partly uh, caused by uh, uh, nature. And indeed, um, in uh, uh, literature of uh, disaster triggered by natural hazards, disaster is actually a product of uh, natural hazard and exposure and vulnerability. Um, and then uh, uh, each disaster caused the uh, enormous direct and indirect impact, uh, many times uh, spill over across time and space. Um, and then, uh, of course, the strengthening uh, re resilience against disaster is uh, critical. Uh, to uh, soften the, this impact arising by uh, disaster. Also, I'd like to note, uh, in spite of this um, uh, substantial damage and economic uh, cost uh, generated by disasters, only very small fraction has been insured by market uh, insurance mechanisms. Um, so 9%, according to um, uh, 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 Munich Re's uh, NATCAT service uh, database, only 9% of uh, disaster losses covered by insurance in Asia, uh, including uh, developed uh, Asia. And uh, the 9% is a figure in 2010. And then uh, we have a one, uh, ADB published uh, one of the um, uh, uh, you know, disaster related reports showing that um, this uh, coverage of uh, a former insurance against just losses remain low, especially for middle and uh, high uh, income uh, uh, Asian economies, roughly uh, around 10%. So uh, this is a quite uh, important um, uh, you know, uh, uh, hole in resilience against uh, disasters. So um, it's really imperable imperative to uncover uh, people's preference changes and also action behavior changes against disasters so that we can strengthen overall resilience against the disaster uh, events. So let me uh, postulate the conceptual framework uh, based on uh, myself and uh, Yoshito Takasaki's uh, 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 paper, 2017 uh, World, World Development paper, uh, where we had a special section uh, focusing on disaster triggered by natural hazard. So top, uh, we start disaster condition. So each individual have uh, some access, uh, high or low access to assets. And then also before uh, disasters, uh, people and household engage or, or businesses engage uh, ex ante management, either uh, disaster risk management or uh, non-disaster risk management. Then disaster often uh, occur unexpectedly and uh, as an unforeseen event. Um, and onset of disaster uh, short run, uh, people change some preference uh, in broader sense, and then uh, also uh, reorganize their actions against the uh, unexpected events, leading to uh, uh, some type of welfare outcome. And um, uh, across time, um, disaster aid and relief come in, and also uh, medium term and long term disaster reconstruction kicked in. So whole range of um, uh, uh, preference changes, action activity change, leading to ultimate um, uh, uh, a change in uh, welfare of people, uh, household, as well as businesses. So this is the um, uh, uh, multiple stage um, uh, trajectory of uh, um, uh, nexus uh, among disaster preference and risk coping and welfare. So having this uh, concept framework in our mind, uh, let me talk about uh, preferences, how preferences are affected by uh, natural, uh, uh, dis disasters triggered by natural hazard. Actually, disaster and um, uh, preference, individual preferences such as a risk aversion parameter, as well as a social preferences, uh, pro social behavior, including trust, um, uh, altruism, et cetera, et cetera, 
I would say um, uh, there, there, there is a two-way uh, causality. Uh, uh, disaster affecting um, individual as well as social preferences. But at the same time, um, individual preferences, preferences and social preferences change the uh, exposure and vulnerability because uh, the, you know, residents uh, this young and also relocation this young and other associated uh, ex ante risk coping or risk management behavior is a part of a disaster. Um, uh, remembering that the disaster is a product of a hazard uh, exposure and vulnerability. So uh, exposure and vulnerability are really driven by human decisions. So there are two way causations uh, admittedly, but uh, let me um, focusing on uh, uh, first causality, how disaster affects the individual and social preferences. So there are uh, already very rich studies um, uh, from, uh, based on a different type of uh, uh, disaster events. And um, uh, also people are taking uh, different um, uh, parameters, uh, risk attitude, risk aversion parameter, and the time uh, domain, uh, exponential time uh, uh, discounting, as well as a hyperbolic uh, discounting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, by the way, um, here, individual preferences, I, I'm talking about uh, risk and the time uh, domain, uh, but of course, um, other uh, parameters such as uh, loss aversion, ambiguity aversion, uh, these parameters can be also investigated, but uh, uh, let me confine our attention to uh, standard risk and time uh, preferences. Um, so this is not a, a complete list, but a partial list, uh, uh, but we can see different country hit by different disasters, um, hurricane or earthquake or floods and um, uh, typhoons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can see there's no conclusive uh, uh, evidence. Um, disaster exposure and disasters uh, can make people more risk averse or less risk averse and also time domain, uh, although relatively speaking, uh, literature is seen on a time domain, but uh, some studies showing that uh, people became uh, more patient, but the other study uh, uh, shows the opposite. So uh, these are the uh, quite the mixed um, evidence we have uh, uh, right now. And um, so you may wonder what the uh, reason behind this uh, inconclusive uh, mixed evidence. So I listed here three possible um, uh, reasons. Number one, uh, different study focusing on um, uh, different subject in different country, different social condition. Also disasters um, uh, uh, under study is different. Uh, so disaster types are different and method of eliciting a preference parameter are also different. So these um, uh, elements may lead to an inconclusive result. Uh, number two, uh, actually specification errors in estimating parameter, uh, that's um, uh, not a negligible issue. Uh, it has been known in uh, experimental economics. When eliciting a time uh, discounting, you should consider concavity of a utility function. So in other words, um, risk aversion parameter, which characterize the concavity of a utility function and the time uh, discounting parameter, these two parameters should be jointly uh, elicited rather than uh, separately elicited. So uh, otherwise they're gonna be specification errors. And number three is uh, disaster exposure and the disaster impact may be inaccurate and the uh, experimental results uh, capturing uh, uh, the parameter may be in inaccurate. So inaccuracy in data may lead to an uh, inconclusive uh, 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 result. So in order to <laughs> further investigate these possible reasons, let me um, put my own uh, research, which is a comparison of uh, two quite distinctive uh, disaster uh, events. One is uh, Iwanuma, Japan, uh, a community hit by uh, uh, East Japan, a uh, Great East Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami event, 2011. So tsunami, earthquake and tsunami, other disaster. And the other one is the Philippines, 2012. Uh, 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 typhoon led the uh, uh, out of season uh, flood event. So um, disaster type is different. So uh, Japan is uh, earthquake and tsunami and Philippines uh, flood. And actually um, in experimental studies, we call uh, respondent subject. 
subject pool are also different. Uh, in Japan, so top left shows the uh, uh, age distribution of uh, uh, Philippines in green and uh, white is uh, Japan. So we, we have uh, Philippines uh, subjects covering a whole range of age group. Rather, uh, rather we have a uh, lot of uh, uh, people in 40s and 50s. Uh, but in Japan, uh, our uh, subject pool is about uh, 65 years old. And then the uh, middle, uh, we see um, uh, uh, income level. And the green is uh, again Philippine. Uh, we have um, a relatively low income people in Philippine uh, subject, and then white in Japan and higher income. And the top right is um, education level. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but uh, we, uh, overall, uh, uh, schooling, uh, years of schooling is uh, longer in Japan subject uh, than uh, uh, Philippine subject. So quite different uh, disaster events and um, uh, different um, uh, socioeconomic uh, background. Then we are gonna do a similar experiment to elicit the deep parameter to see what's gonna happen. So that's the way uh, we did. Uh, to at least par partly reconcile uh, in conclusive uh, existing studies finding. So again, uh, Iwanuma is sitting in uh, Miyagi prefecture affected by um, uh, Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. Uh, actually one of the uh, largest uh, uh, damage caused to, the, caused to the Iwanuma city in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the area size of um, uh, uh, impact of uh, uh, impact caused by a tsunami. And the right is um, a Philippine subject coming from uh, one village uh, uh, from uh, Laguna province, south of uh, Manila. And indeed, um, uh, this village has been studied by uh, late Professor Hayami and uh, Professor Kikuchi since 1974, uh, more than 40 years. So that's why we know uh, uh, the baseline before uh, uh, flood uh, situation and after flood situation. So we uh, conducted the two by two by two hybrid experiment, what I call. So two waves of um, experiment uh, for Japan, 2014 and 2017, three years and six years after that disaster event. And Philippines, 2014 and 2018. So two years and six years after the event. So same subject and we conducted two waves. And then uh, in order to, um, uh, check the validation of our qualitative result against the uh, different experimental method. We adopted the uh, convex time budget experiment by Andrea and Springer, uh, AR 2012, and also another uh, common uh, way to elicit the parameters, uh, Anderson et al. So called the two type of uh, uh, time, um, uh, uh, multiple uh, time. Uh, 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 time uh, discounting uh, 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 experiment. Uh, Anderson et al. 2008 econometric uh, paper we uh, closely follow. So um, two incentivized games applied to uh, two different uh, disaster events in uh, different uh, socioeconomic background. So two by two by two experiment we conducted. And also I'd like to note um, uh, our uh, experimental methods um, are kind of a standard one validated in experimental economics. But at the same time, our disaster uh, loss measure are quite accurate. In the case of Japan, we use the uh, earthquake uh, uh, caused um, uh, home damage uh, certified by, officially certified, certified by uh, uh, local governments uh, using uh, quite detailed metri metrical uh, survey. And um, uh, for the um, Philippines, uh, we, correct uh, 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 farmland damage information from satellite imagery covering before and after the um, uh, uh, floods. So you can see uh, down, uh, there are two satellite images uh, uh, before and after disasters, uh, floods in the Philippines. So we have a very accurate objective measure of uh, disaster uh, damage. So this is the result. Um, some um, uh, core uh, uh, findings. Um, first one is uh, Japan, uh, Great East Japan earthquake in Iwanuma. Um, so top left is the um, uh, convex time budget experiment and um, uh, showing, vertical access showing uh, proportion people who take um, uh, area uh, choice. Uh, so this is a choice experiment. So you, you are asked to 
pick uh, earlier uh, payoff or you can wait. Uh, top left case uh, 35 days. So right now you get uh, immediately payoff or you can wait 35 days. And um, uh, second one from the top left is uh, today versus 63 days. And um, the proportion of uh, taking uh, today's uh, payoff is uh, higher systematically if uh, a subject encounter uh, house damage. So higher the damage, then uh, higher the proportion of people um, deciding to take a present uh, uh, you know, payout. Uh, so this shows the um, higher uh, uh, discount rate, uh, I mean, higher discount rate for those who are exposed to disaster. But if you redo the same thing, now uh, setting, not today versus uh, 35 days, but 35 data versus uh, 70 days data. So that's the uh, down left. And um, uh, second one from down left is uh, um, area choice is 63 days uh, later versus uh, another 63 days uh, later. Okay, so the time difference are the same. But uh, you know, area payoff comes later on um, uh, down two um, uh, cases. So in this case, you don't see uh, statistically uh, a meaningful difference. So actually, this whole chart showing that uh, people became uh, present biased or uh, a more hyper hyperbolic discount became uh, more salient due to exposure to uh, housing damage. So this is the one qualitative very very, um, how to say, strong uh, qualitative uh, findings we obtain from our experiment. Right chart showing um, uh, uh, risk domain. Um, and um, so summarizing uh, our experiment uh, and showing sort of a utility frontier, uh, the choice uh, between probability of choosing a safety, a safer lottery uh, versus a probability of winning larger price. So, so there is a kind of trade-off uh, set by this um, uh, particular experiment, and downward sloping. But actually, uh, being exposed to a, a larger uh, a damage uh, caused by disaster, uh, people's uh, preference shift uh, inside, meaning that uh, people prefer uh, um, being exposed to a disaster. People prefer uh, less safer lottery or riskier lottery. So making people systematically uh, risk tolerant uh, being exposed to the disaster. So, so these are very strong, uh, clear uh, uh, qualitative results found in uh, Japan, uh, all the subject uh, above 65 and old and earthquake and tsunami exposure uh, uh, and Japan, okay, higher income. So we redo exactly the same experiment in Laguna, the Philippines with the younger, including a younger uh, people and farming area, lower income, less education, and then even uh, not earthquake, but uh, flood. So basically we found same thing. Okay? So people became uh, more um, uh, present biased, although, you know, uh, although a reference um, uh, uh, high public discount rate is, uh, um, uh, I mean, discount factor is lower, a beta is lower for, in the case of Philippines, uh, many people are more uh, present biased, but being exposed to the flood uh, and uh, submergence of your uh, farmland with the water, uh, people became even uh, more uh, present biased. And then risk, in terms of risk, being exposed to the disaster, you become uh, more risk tolerant. So qualitatively, exactly the same finding we uh, receive. Um, so because we, as I mentioned, we did them uh, twice, um, um, you know, few years, only a couple of years after the uh, disaster event, and also four or five years after the event. Uh, we observe a persistence of uh, preference parameter change and also the direction of the change at the same. So basically disaster made people more present bias and less risk averse. And uh, same qualitative result found in two by two by two hybrid experiment. Uh, actually, we believe this finding is quite important, uh, uh, has a quite important implications. Uh, social con conditions difference between Japan and, and uh, the Philippines, disaster type difference, as well as method of measuring preferences. 
uh, not nearly uh, uh, related to uh, mixed finding reported in the literature. And uh, one uh, possible implication uh, is um, uh, specification errors and inaccuracy of data on just exposure and experiment may um, uh, drive the um, inconsistent mixed finding in the literature. But I think uh, this is the point we need to uh, uh, look into deeper in the future studies. So, and then another uh, preference uh, parameters, uh, social preferences, trust, altruism, and uh, reciprocity, et cetera. So again, uh, this is a partial uh, uh, review of existing studies. So some study shows the uh, disaster exposure make people less pro-social. The other study uh, making people more pro-social. Again, mixed uh, evidence. So how to reconcile this uh, mixed evidence? So I I'd like to postulate two possible uh, theoretical mechanisms behind the um, uh, uh, disaster impact. Uh, first one is um, uh, pure or impure uh, altruism. So, so altruism is basically equalization of uh, marginal utility of your own. And also your uh, uh, utility function enters your counterpart's utility. So you equalize your own marginal utility and also your counterpart's marginal utility, okay? Then you decide how much to help your counterpart, depending on your, uh, you know, altruistic uh, uh, parameter. And um, uh, so in this situation, uh, you yourself being exposed to disaster and your resources shrunk, then your major utility goes up. And that means you have a less incentive to transfer to your counterpart, you know, either income or in-kind transfer. So actually theoretical prediction of uh, a pure or impure altruism is uh, yourself being exposed to disaster, then you will become uh, less uh, altruistic, okay? Um, so that's the uh, theoretical uh, prediction. But uh, there, there could be another mechanism. Uh, people are not uh, playing a one-shot uh, relationship or one-shot game, but a repeated game. So if we are bringing in infinitely repeated um, uh, prisoner's dilemma type of a repeated game, then you yourself uh, uh, affected by disaster and losing asset. That means that your fallback option, outside option, payoff will goes down. That means that your um, uh, cooperation set uh, in a repeated game will expand. So in that case, uh, you, you think uh, you should uh, cooperate more and you should become more nicer to other people so that you can uh, uh, gain out of this uh, possible cooperation. So actually repeated game uh, gives uh, uh, precisely opposite prediction. Disaster exposure makes people more pro-social. Okay. So I think one possibility is because uh, actual uh, reality is a mixture of these two mechanisms. So, so that uh, we, we don't see a unified uh, impact of disaster on uh, uh, pro-social behavior. And then uh, I thought maybe we can use uh, age gradient. So older people, you know, at age of 80, uh, your remaining life is shorter and shorter. So uh, these people won't play repeated game or shadow future uh, will play a less role. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis young people who has uh, 20 and 30 or 40 years in social life and also workplace uh, relationship, uh, these young people may interest in, you know, corporate more. So the second uh, uh, impact, uh, second mechanism may uh, dominate the first one. And uh, actually using uh, Great East Japan earthquake uh, 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 data uh, from uh, uh, Iwanuma, as well as another uh, place uh, called the Futaba, Futaba, uh, Futaba town affected by uh, uh, nuclear power plant, power plant failure. We track um, uh, almost 10 years of the household in this uh, displaced families from uh, Futaba. And uh, both places, um, uh, when I bring in age gradient, then qualitative result uh, supports these two possible uh, uh, mechanisms. Younger people cooperate more and uh, being exposed to the disaster and older people cooperate less being exposed to the disaster. Especially young people who have a, a regular job and workplace relationship uh, shows the uh, more pro-sociality being after being exposed to the disaster. So 
actually two uh, mechanisms seems to be supported by uh, data from the Great East Japan earthquake. And um, uh, how many minutes do I have? May can um, I spend? Maybe you could quickly wrap, wrap up in one, one or two minutes. Okay. Or, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> risk coping behavior I wanted to discuss. Uh, so canonical life cycle permanent income hypothesis and the risk sharing hypothesis. Um, uh, consumption movement is affected by shock. So, and then um, uh, whether shock uh, coefficient A1 here, uh, uh, you know, regressing uh, uh, log uh, consumption change, regress on shock uh, variables. And uh, if uh, this uh, A1 uh, shock parameter is zero, then that um, uh, uh, tells us some type of a market of non market insurance mechanisms uh, effective overall. And if uh, A1 is um, uh, negative or different from zero, then that manifests um, a lack of uh, insurance mechanism. So we can rewrite this uh, consumption equation in terms of a uh, financing side of consumption because consumption, second equation, consumption should be financed either by income, including a transfer, public transfer, private transfer, and also uh, uh, borrowing or this saving. So this is the financing side and intertemporal budget constraints. So I, we can simply rewrite the first equation into a financing side or a coping against the uh, shocks. So, so this is the final uh, uh, equation. And, and the parameter, uh, deep parameters uh, play a role as an intervening variable in this um, uh, coping and shock nexus. And again, there are rich uh, uh, studies uh, working on uh, uh, uncovering uh, how uh, shocks, disaster shocks affect the uh, risk coping strategies. Um, again, this is a, a partial list, but um, uh, different disaster event, different damage. Uh, we can see people use the uh, consumption itself uh, adjustment as well as a borrowing, disaving, labor adjustment or extending a labor participation uh, has a relatively moderate role, but uh, private transfer, public transfer play a big role. And uh, again, world development uh, special section, uh, we had a paper on Vietnam showing that uh, self-production, precaution saving, and credit accessibility play a role as a risk coping against the different type of uh, disaster in Vietnam. And uh, Arbat, uh, our, our chief economist Arbat and uh, Sangui Wang has a, a paper on a great Sichuan earthquake in China uh, in the World Development Special Section. And uh, they found a government emergency relief uh, quite substantial. So uh, private transfer, labor supply and borrowing seems to be crowded out. Um, so having seen this uh, risk coping, let me wrap up uh, talking about the overall welfare. So how um, uh, these uh, disaster event, preference changes, risk coping behavior, uh, reorganization, how that leads to overall welfare. So we can bring in uh, to some extent uh, public health or epidemiology studies, uh, public health uh, psychology, uh, welfare outcomes can be uh, captured by life satisfaction, self-reported uh, one, and happiness measures, and also clinically validated measure of mental health. And um, uh, now uh, economics re research also moving forward to address um, a psychological poverty trap. Uh, this is um, uh, related. But uh, overall, just a research in public health uh, repeatedly showing, uh, uh, no surprise, but repeatedly showing exposure to the disaster make people depressed, uh, traumatized, and also other psychiatric disorders generated by disasters. Uh, and at the same time, a social capital or a community relationship seems to soften uh, these uh, negative uh, consequences of uh, disaster on uh, mental health. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, this is a, a, a kind of final slide I'd like to bring in. So overall welfare, um, of course, uh, uh, economics, we take a utility, but in order to achieve a utility, which is a function of certain level of consumption, in order to achieve a certain level of consumption, you have to adapt a, a different type of a, a financing side or risk coping. And indeed, um, uh, Chetty and Looney has a very nice, um, um, a very tractable framework talking not only direct uh, uh, welfare, but also a cost or this utility of adapting a particular uh, risk coping behavior. 
And I don't have time to elaborate this, but uh, finally, uh, Chetty and Looney Framework said uh, a benefit of social insurance to cover different type of negative shock can be uh, expressed by this uh, uh, final equation. Basically, a uh, function of uh, risk aversion parameter. If you are risk averse, then having a social uh, insurance, you gain a lot. Okay? The other one is, of course, uh, adapting a, a costly risk coping behavior. If you are always uh, forced to adapt a very costly risk coping, then, of course, having a social insurance, you gain a lot. Okay, so basically, gamma parameter and theta, uh, the cost uh, uh, leads to uh, uh, very fair. And basically, uh, he, their paper saying that the uh, usual consumption smoothing test is misleading. You have to really incorporate and explicitly consider a uh, marginal cost of about adopting a different type of uh, uh, risk coping behavior. And actually, Charles data um, uh, panel data set from China, uh, 2011, 2013, 2015, and 2018, we quantify uh, and we uh, kind of estimated this, uh, uh, this utility parameter arising from a health shock. And we found, especially rural area, uh, down left, rural area, uh, if people uh, this save, uh, actually saving, saving um, uh, uh, actually lower your um, uh, stress, meaning uh, this saving to handle negative shock is quite costly for you. And also borrowing uh, is quite costly. Uh, on the other, other hand, uh, receiving a transpass have a, a milder impact on your uh, uh, mental health. So actually this uh, manuscript itself, um, uh, as observed uh, in uh, actual uh, situation in China, um, lack of social insurance, making people adapting a costly uh, risk coping strategy and um, uh, that leads to uh, overall uh, mental health uh, kind of a deterioration. So let me wrap up, so, so, sorry to uh, spend uh, more than two minutes, uh, but um, academic side, I think uh, literature is very rich, but mixed. So we need more uh, systematic uh, review and more studies. And also we need to uh, place uh, different uh, patchy uh, empirical evidence into a unified framework. So we need a theories and systematic test. Policy side, I think overall formal insurance uh, building up uh, that's uh, really critical, especially uh, in the developing country. And also um, exposed uh, coping are said to be costly than the ex ante action. So I think uh, uh, government needs to nudge people to undertake, uh, people and businesses undertake uh, uh, disaster prevention and ex ante preparedness investment. Uh, and finally, uh, but not least, although I, I, I couldn't spend time, but the rural community is very important to strengthen uh, market failure and government failure. So, so these are the uh, future challenges I'd like to address. With that, I'd like to stop and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Suya. So uh, we already have uh, uh, questions from the floor. Uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, invite Dosa to unmute yourself and then talk to you also directly. Dosa, please. Yeah, uh, please kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, at the, uh, yes, please. Um, thank you very much, Professor Sawada. Uh, my question is, uh, how has social media affected either positively or negatively the pro-social behaviors uh, exhibited by different groups based on your study? So basically, this is three generations. You have youth, and then you have the adults, and then the, the elderly, uh, especially in their uh, initial response to the disasters. Because I am asking this question in relation to what I posted in the chat box regarding the MSME guidebook to disaster resilience, which was uh, published in 2020 here in the Philippines. Thank you, um, uh, Doris. Um, actually, a uh, little bit difficult to um, um, uh, hear your voice, but uh, your question is about the role of media? Or, uh, well, um, the role of social media and also I think social media. basically it's two questions. One is social media uh, in terms of immediate response, humanitarian response 
through the disasters. And then my second question would be, um, is there at the Asian level, or at least in your um, research, a similar MSME or micro, small, and medium enterprise guidebook to disaster resilience for both natural calamities and man-made risk or hazards? So that uh, there will be business continuity. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for first question, role of uh, social media, uh, uh, I think that's uh, really critical. And uh, we observe uh, when, um, uh, you know, um, uh, headline news announce a big disaster hitting certain community, then naturally uh, people tended to send uh, lots of um, uh, cash and in-kind support. So definitely uh, a broader sense, social media now, not only um, uh, usual, uh, uh, you know, TV news and newspaper, but also uh, uh, social network services really play a role to stimulate people's uh, altruism and uh, uh, you know mutual help. And uh, I, I would say this is a, a community mechanism, in broader sense, uh, playing a role to support uh, peoples, uh, those who are affected by disaster. So I think um, social media play a key role. But uh, actually. Uh, Somewhat unbalanced uh, resource allocation, we also observe, um, especially uh, you know big disaster hitting a developed economy, um, um, uh, catching um, uh, lots of media attention. But uh, relatively speaking, uh, huge disaster affecting um, a small locality in developing country or low income uh, country uh, uh, receive uh, less attention in media globally. So I think uh, there is uh, some unbalanced uh, uh, media uh, treatment or uh, uh, news value leading to a less uh, support from a broader uh, uh, civil society. So I think that's a very important. And uh, secondly, um, you have questions about uh, MSMEs, um, uh, how business continuity practices and basic concept of disaster risk reduction management. Uh, actually, this is a very critical point. Um, we talk a lot about um, how individual and the poor families affected by disaster and how to support uh, these uh, families and the livelihood. So, um, you know, disaster, formal insurance, uh, informal insurance, um, uh, you know, uh, basically focusing on um, consumer or household or individual side. Uh, but uh, the uh, research on the business uh, insurance or disaster insurance uh, really largely missing. And also in reality, um, you know, earthquake insurance in Japan, uh, basically household based and um, uh, micro insurance uh, programs. Now a uh, lot of experiment, experiments done in India and uh, Africa and other developing countries. They are basically focusing on uh, either families or uh, either farmers. So MSME's disasters are missing. Even a 2011 uh, a Thai uh, flood uh, in Ayutthaya, uh, enormous uh, 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 you know, damage caused by a flood uh, to um, uh, uh, micro enterprises up to uh, big enterprises. But actually um, we did a study and I will share with you uh, uh, some papers. Uh, we found um, basically lack of uh, uh, disaster insurance beforehand, even a large, uh, uh, large uh, enterprises are not covered by uh, insurance. And insurance, there are two types of insurance for business. One is uh, asset insurance, asset damage. The other one is a business uh, disruption insurance. And particularly uh, business disruption insurance uh, really uh, uncommon. Uh, uh, so I think uh, this is a very, very uh, large missing uh, area and we need to Strengthen. But having this set, a uh, business continuity, actually BCP, um, um, uh, you know, already um, uh, there is um, uh, ISO, uh, ISO has a business continuity uh, part. So actually uh, there is a formal, um, uh, you know, framework, you know, what uh, a business and um, uh, including micro enterprise should do beforehand uh, to uh, prepare for um, uh, uh, prepare for uh, uh, disasters. So uh, one example I'd like to give you is ISO. I thought the number, but I can give you uh, exact number of ISO for a business continuity uh, plan. And also beyond the business continuity plan, we have to talk about the business con uh, continuity uh, management. 
So um, I, I think this, in any case, uh, this is a really uh, uh, big area we need to look into. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for asking uh, these two very important questions. Okay, uh, thanks Yasu and thanks everyone. I think we, uh, we, 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 we sort of run over time. So I would like to pass over to Kao to, uh, for information for the next uh, afternoon sessions. Thanks Kao. This is uh, what a great session and, and thank you so much everyone. Uh, let's take a quick look at what's uh, coming up next in our agenda. We've got session two, which will be starting at 1.15 Manila time. So that's in just less than 15 minutes uh, and 2.15 PM in Tokyo. Session 2A is going to be about environment and energy, uh, environment and energy one, 2B on monetary and regional economics, 2C on health, human capital and welfare, and 2D on the Asian Development Review. And you can find the links to that uh, in the welcome pack that was sent to you, uh, as well as your calendar invite. And we're going to paste a link to that in the chat as well. Um, thanks, everyone, and we will be seeing you shortly.